Welcome everyone to this month's episode of Biotherapy Live. Today's session will focus on your questions and our answers uh, about maggot therapy. We'll get started in just a minute. Uh, first, I'm gonna let Albert play that uh, uh, introduction. So take it away, Albert. You're uh, muted, Dr. Yes, another statement by the um, by the uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence that's running the show here. Um, first kicks me out and then mutes me when I come back. Um, in any event, hopefully that video uh, finished and, and uh, went well. I missed the whole thing. I missed the best part of the program. Well, anyway, uh, I am broadcasting from the Better Foundation office, the old office, which is now vacated. You can see all our books are gone. They're with Albert. Um, and the internet is on its way out, it looks like, too. So hopefully uh, we won't have too many of these problems as the show goes on. Nonetheless, uh, we're going to continue with uh, your questions and our answers. So let me go ahead and uh, share the screen. And I'll be asking Albert a lot uh, today to make sure that he's seeing the image because some of these images are disappearing from me. Here we go. Your questions, our answers. We took a lot of questions in a, a program or two previously. And some of these questions may be the same. Some may be slightly the same. Hopefully many are different. Uh, but even, even if questions are coming in that we addressed previously, uh, it's, it's worth going over them again <clears throat> because the questions still exist. Maybe it wasn't clear, maybe people didn't hear. So we're gonna go over the questions um, uh, even if they do, even if some of them are a little bit repetitive. And a good one to start with is a basic question. What are the pros and cons of maggot therapy? A lot has been written and I'm gonna try and condense it down into a, a few key points. Uh, the benefits are really that maggot debridement provides a fast, relatively safe, uh, very effective form of debridement or wound cleaning, which is relatively inexpensive and maggot therapy also uses few other resources. You can do it without a surgeon. You can get a very thorough debridement without requiring even a uh, physician is not necessary. Often the nurses will do it. In some areas where uh, nursing access is difficult, Patients will do it themselves or their family members will do it themselves. Uh, as outpatients, it's commonly done. Even in the home, in home care, it's done. 
So it utilizes few medical resources. <clears throat> the drawbacks, well, it's maggots. And for many, that's, that's the, a serious drawback itself. Um, maggots rarely escape. And if you apply the dressings correctly, they won't escape. Uh, a few people do have pain during maggot therapy, but we know who they are going to be because they have painful wounds. They have pain when you change their dressings, regardless of what treatment they're getting. Some have pain all the time, even with their dressings. So they should be prepared, they should be told that when the maggots are crawling about the wound, they may have pain then too. Um, if you are looking to earn a living by doing maggot therapy, um, that's not the way to uh, earn a living, uh, however. Uh, maggot therapy is, is not, uh, because maggot therapy doesn't require uh, all these advanced resources, um, uh, reimbursement for the procedure is not uh, very significant. Uh, the maggots uh, uh, cost is basically the same as a, a tube of debriding enzymes like collagenase. So let's move on to question number two. Are patients typically using just one application of maggot therapy for 48 hours or several sessions? The simple answer here is that the median number of treatments, that is 50% of patients using maggot therapy are treated with just one application of maggot therapy that is sufficient to completely debride or clean their wound. Those patients who are getting maggot therapy on an ongoing basis for what we call maintenance debridement, or maybe to induce some wound closure, uh, who cannot have surgical closure, who are not eligible for a graft, or maybe they are awaiting uh, some form of a, a procedure that won't be in a couple of weeks, they may sometimes receive a treatment once every week or once every other week. We call this maintenance debridement because it, it helps minimize the colonization, uh, reduce or prevent infection, um, dissolves, it's been found to dissolve biofilm and so on and so forth. But what you're really doing is you, you are maintaining that wound in a very clean state at the, at the very least. Question number three, how do we write the order when you are prescribing maggot therapy? Orders are done in a variety of ways. It depends on the therapist themselves and their style and their preferences but it also depends on um, the venue, on where you are in the medical scheme of things. In the hospital, you'll have an order on the chart, order entered into the computer. Uh, in an office setting for outpatients, you, you may get a prescription. Um, and sometimes the doctor simply writes uh, or fills out the order form from the company that's providing the maggots. And there they will place their name, their license information, and that will serve as the order. So let's take as an example, the situation where you want to provide more details. You might write the prescription on a prescription pad or at the hospital, something like maggot therapy, um, uh, for up to three sessions or maggot therapy as needed uh, up to three sessions for debridement. It's a good idea 
to always include your indication with the order, you're certainly going to want to put down the indication in the medical record. Uh, this is important, not just for insurance purposes, but for good communication with those who will be referring to the chart later on. So maggot therapy, um, PRN as needed for debridement or wound cleaning, up to three treatments. If you want to be more specific, you can say uh, leave on for 48 hours, change outer dressing two or three times a day as needed for soiling. You can go into greater detail, and in fact, uh, the Better Foundation has written and posted a template for procedures, uh, policy and procedures for maggot therapy that can give some more detailed guidance in that respect. These policies and procedures are available for downloading from the Better Foundation website www.betefoundation.org. And you can also uh, email us or call us uh, for a copy if you're having trouble finding that. If a wound comes in with maggots in it, usually the wound is on a patient or on a person, comes in, okay, and the maggots can be removed but for any possible larvae, I was told acetone is the only chemical that will kill them. Is this true? And by the way, I should mention right now, even though all these questions came in in advance, in anticipation of this session, or just uh, came, came in to the Better Foundation to be answered, um, if you have any questions, those of you who are watching at home, you can put them in the chat box. You can put them in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook, uh, or you can send in your own questions uh, if you're viewing this program later. Uh, Albert will interrupt me if he gets uh, some questions coming in while we're doing these prepared uh, questions. But we put these together, which came in in advance. So if someone comes in with maggots, uh, I see two questions here, really. Oh, one is uh, acetone the only chemical that will kill them? And perhaps the other question is, should I be using acetone? Um, acetone is not the only chemical, and I would not advise putting acetone on the body, let alone on some wound where the maggots are probably sitting. Maggots usually are not just crawling over the skin unless they're trespassing, just uh, crawling through. They're usually attracted by and sitting on uh, a wound. Um, acetone is not a very pleasant or therapeutic thing uh, to put on the wound, not even for, uh, not even to get the, the maggots out. In fact, you can and should get the maggots out um, much more benignly. Um, so let's talk about that. And then we'll talk about chemicals that can kill the maggots. What I do when someone comes in with a wound infested with maggots, that's called myiasis. Uh, after taking the history, the exam, all that stuff, I will collect a few maggots, by the way. You'll want to send them to the laboratory, like any other specimen, to be identified. Um, but you don't need them all. So, to get them off very effectively, efficiently, quickly. Um, I will usually um, uh, fill up a bucket with uh, one part hydrogen peroxide or one part uh, 
sodium hypochlorite uh, Dakin solution or one part uh, povidone iodine and four parts of water. So it's a dilute uh, solution of one of those three and then uh, dip the, uh, the leg, the arm, wherever that wound is into this uh, solution and, and wait 20 to 30 minutes. In about 15 to 20 minutes, well, let me, let me back up a second. The maggots, um, in order to prevent drowning, will plug up their breathing holes. Their breathing holes, which are on the posterior end, are called spiracles, and they'll actually be able to close them out close them off completely and the liquid will not penetrate, but they can only do that for about 20 minutes. And by that time, they're, they're not gonna be able to get enough air there. They are obligate air breathers. So they're going to have to open up those breathing holes. They will let go therefore from the wound and swim for it and they'll float to the top and there they can breathe, but they're off the wound. Don't leave the patient alone uh, like this in the, with that tub of water because the maggots can swim. They will swim to the edges of the bucket and crawl up the sides of the bucket. So if you can't be there to watch, uh, um, besides uh, putting on your camera so you don't miss anything, you can come back later. Uh, take some petroleum jelly or other similar gooey ointment and put that around the, the top of the bucket or the bowl so that the maggots can't actually crawl out of the bowl. Now this works very well for wounds on the upper and lower extremities. It doesn't work very well for a head wound, let's say, with, that's infested with maggots. Um, it's not very good for the back uh, or, or the buttocks or some other areas. Uh, an alternative is the shower. You can put someone in the shower and rinse the maggots off. It's a little more work. Uh, but it's equally effective and the um, maggots will go down the drain. Uh, is that a problem? Well, in terms of infection, it is the, the, the infection, the microorganisms are the same as if they had washed their wound uh, in the shower or in the sink. Um, and the maggots will die uh, in, the, in the sewer system. Let's say you've got some maggots and they're on the chucks or they're falling off, or maybe this isn't a case of myiasis, but you actually have um, maggots, therapeutic maggots that you want to kill. There are several ways to kill them. Again, much better than applying acetone. Now, if you've got the maggots off the patient, you could drop them in acetone, but acetone isn't one of the more common chemicals uh, in the emergency room or in the clinic. What's more, the maggots are going to close their spiracles and not let the acetone in. And the acetone isn't going to work immediately on their exoskeleton or cuticle uh, and kill them uh, right through the, the uh, exoskeleton. Uh, so regardless of what you put them in, the maggots will not die instantly. Uh, I will put them into alcohol uh, or formaldehyde, formalin, uh, which I have access to in the medical setting, much easier than acetone. Still, 
it's going to be half an hour, an hour, three hours, depending on uh, which chemical for alcohol, it could be three, four, five hours, and you'll still see them wiggling a little bit in there, but it will kill them, uh, but it's, it's a, a slow kill. Another way to do it a faster way, uh, if you are, um, um, if you choose to be a little more humane, uh, is to put them in the freezer. Uh, in that case, usually within an hour or two, they will pass on um, without a lot of squirming and, uh, and bother. Um, let's move on to the next uh, question. Oh, this is a study we did uh, about how to kill a maggot or a fly egg, effects of food storage and handling on blowfly eggs. Uh, and so if you want more information on exactly how long it takes uh, before the maggots are dead, if you put them in the freezer, refrigerator, microwave, uh, stir fry wok, or uh, boiling water, uh, this is uh, going to answer your questions. And for more information on um, how to optimally remove maggots that come into the medical center on a host, on a human, uh, you can check out the uh, paper on wound myiasis. Uh, from uh, Archives of Internal Medicine uh, 2000, or this uh, paper in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology from 2005, where we talk about uh, preventing, mitigating, treating patients who acquire their maggots uh, non-therapeutically in the hospital or come to the hospital uh, with their own. Question number five, what complications can non-medical maggots cause if found in a patient? Is there a way to determine if all the maggots have been rinsed out and do they hide down in the tissue? <clears throat> Notice we kind of arranged these questions as much as possible to kind of stay within the, the same topic. Well, in that study I uh, showed in a previous slide, looking at the epidemiology of maggot infestations or myiasis in the United States among patients who come in with their own maggots to the medical center, what we found uh, in this prospective study is that there were no complications among the 40 uh, or so patients who, uh, uh, who were part of the study. Uh, their wounds were clean. Uh, no complications were seen, even though if you did a literature review of case reports, you're going to find some very dramatic case reports, um, but that's really the difference, isn't it? Between a case report, which you pick and choose, and you usually want to choose the thing that is most unusual and most noteworthy or most attention grabbing, and that's what you're gonna publish, as opposed to a prospective study where you take all comers and you get a better idea of what is the likelihood truly that you're going to encounter A, B, or C. <clears throat> so complications are very rare. With this caveat in mind, it really depends on the species of maggot. In the United States, generally, they're going to be blowfly maggots, uh, rarely a flesh fly, sarcophagid, or a house fly, musca domestica, um, 
sporid flies or coffin flies and uh, fruit flies uh, even more rarely. <clears throat> All of these are relatively benign. They feed on dead tissue. They, um, they generally do not uh, invade healthy tissue, again, depending on the species. <clears throat> But there are some flies that can be very aggressive and very invasive, uh, the most famous of which is the screwworm fly, Cochleomyia hominivorax, the human eater. Um, so you should always remove the maggots that are wild type that patients come in with um, that are non-therapeutic in part because you don't really know what kind of maggot they are. And although there shouldn't be any of the screwworm flies in the United States right now, they could come back. It could be another kind of invasive fly and you shouldn't risk it. There is no reason to risk it. Anyone who calls me and says, well, you know, this wound was really giving us a hard time and now it looks like it's getting better. I would really like to leave those maggots there. I tell them that's a bad choice. It's a bad choice, uh, not only because you don't know exactly what species it is, not only because they were not germ-free, they were not medical grade, and they could have introduced some microorganisms in there and leaving them in there is only going to um, allow those organisms to, to continue to grow and maybe cause some problem. But it's also not a good idea medical legally because there's absolutely no reason to treat a wound with wild type maggots. If you really believe that maggot therapy is going to be beneficial for their uh, wound, then take out the wild type maggots and put in um, commercially available, uh, FDA regulated, um, uh, germ free medicinal maggots. Is there a way to determine if all the maggots have been rinsed out? The best you can do is look at it and keep looking for at least 30 seconds. And if you don't see any movement, um, you know, that's the best you can do. And that's good enough. Uh, you probably got them all, unless there are some sinus tracts or undermining, which you might be able to probe with a cotton swab, but you can also, uh, just put a moist gauze pad in the wound, cover it up. Uh, if there's one or two stragglers uh, uh, left behind, they're going to go finish uh, uh, eating uh, whatever remaining infected dead tissue they're, they are finding or finish hiding uh, and then uh, crawl into the gauze pad and you'll remove it uh, 12 to 24 hours later. I know I just said initially remove the wild type maggots, but one or two or five or 10 maggots left behind, uh, if truly the wound is large enough and must have had enough maggots uh, that um, that now that's all that's hiding, um, that's not going to be a big problem. Uh, if you did use the bucket drowning method to get the, the maggots, you probably have them all. Don't be closing up a wound. Don't put ointment uh, on top of the wound uh, to try and get the last ones out uh, because you could kill them. Uh, and then you'd have this foreign tissue in there 
with uh, bacteria or germs in its gut uh, that is sitting there and can cause problems. So you want them to all crawl out. And if they didn't crawl out, then you were trying to take them off, whether they are the wild type or the medicinal type, um, they will come out within 24 hours. Uh, so just uh, give them the opportunity to do that. Do they hide down in the tissue? Yes, they can, they will hide in the crevices, the nooks and crannies, um, but they do not invade healthy tissue. Uh, generally, again, in this context, we're talking about wild type maggots. We don't know what species they are. That's why you try and get them out. But in that epidemiologic study, 95% were blowflies. In fact, 85 or 86%, somewhere thereabouts, were the very same species that is used medicinally. Um, and so the chances of an invasive fly are, are pretty low. Question number six, can maggot therapy be used in long-term care facilities? Absolutely, yes. It can be used and is used in long-term care, uh, rehab centers, nursing homes, assisted living. It's used in home care. Um, it's used in hospice care. Would this be appropriate for a patient in hospice with fully sloughed pressure injuries? Yes, absolutely. Now, whether a patient is in hospice, or any other setting, if they are an appropriate patient and it is an appropriate wound for a surgical debridement, a sharp debridement, why you can do that in a matter of minutes, right? But, uh, very often, not only in hospice, but in many, many other settings, uh, the, that surgical debridement is not really your first choice and the maggots will uh, be able to, uh, to uh, debrid the sloughed uh, pressure injuries and other similar wounds, not in a few minutes, but certainly in a, in a couple of days. One treatment for 48 hours, sometimes it's left for 72 hours, uh, uh, is often sufficient. Are we able to use maggot therapy in home health? And how do you order? So yes, home health too, it can be uh, done. Generally, well, not generally, always, the treatment in the United States requires a doctor's order. In most of Europe, it requires a doctor's order. So you need to get a doctor's order. If you are the doctor, it's easy peasy, you just order it. But if you're not the doctor, then you need to, let's say you are the um, uh, healthcare provider that uh, is involved in the um, home health visits, you're the, the nurse practitioner. Well, let's skip that. Uh, you are the visiting nurse. Let's say you're the visiting nurse uh, or another member of the team that cannot prescribe. Then you have to speak to the prescriber. In some states, that is the nurse practitioner. In other states, even the nurse practitioner cannot order or has to have their orders um, uh, overviewed, so uh, then discuss with the doctor. But whoever is able to, uh, who is licensed to prescribe, can prescribe the maggot therapy. And that order uh, really then just goes to the home health team, however it normally does, by fax, by written orders, by um, as a prescription uh, or 
uh, very often write on the medicinal maggot order form if that order form has a place uh, where the doctor can show evidence that he or she uh, is the prescriber. How do you bring maggot therapy into an acute rehab or long-term care facility? Well, I'll tell you how I bring it in. I bring it in a brown paper bag when no one is watching. But my wife, she brings them in in class in a special bag just for the maggots with a nice, uh, uh, with, with her other supplies in a, in a maggot bag. Um, but if the question is more to the effect of how do you introduce the procedure into long-term care or similar facilities, uh, well then that would be a different answer. And it is um, uh, uh, probably best addressed by this article from Wound Care Advisor 2014. It's a two-part article really using maggots in wound care, but part one is all about maggot therapy. Part two, which is available uh, to view or download from the internet. Um, part two is specifically how to introduce maggot therapy into your facility, whether it's long-term care or the clinic or the medical center. Um, it's, it's really all the same. Number one, do your homework, know about maggot therapy, know what you, you know, why you want it. Do you have the appropriate patients? Uh, do you have the, the need? Number two, identify some colleagues uh, who agree. Uh, they do not have to be the same, the same uh, division as you are in. And in fact, ultimately you're going to want uh, a team just like a wound care team to be um, adequately uh, diversified. So a doctor, a nurse, someone from infection control, uh, someone from nutrition, dietary, uh, maybe uh, case management, social work, uh, or administration, whoever is going to be, who, you, know, you, you put out feelers uh, <laughs> to use a, uh, an entomology term. Um, get a sense of who is supporting, supportive, um, and, and make yourself a team. Then once you are a team, not a single individual, you are in a much better position to then approach the uh, administration. My screen is telling me that the internet here is unstable. So forgive me if I disappear again, uh, if so. Um, well, I'll be right back shortly. So once you have a group of colleagues together, then you are in a better position to approach the admi administration. And how you do that and the procedure you do that really depends on uh, your facility. It may be through the wound care division. It may be through surgery. It may be directly through um, the, administ the uh, administrators or uh, representatives. Um, a good ally to have the, in advance uh, on your team before you, before you get too far is someone from infection control. Maybe someone from facilities management also because these are going to be the 
the, some of the greatest obstacles, concerns about infection, concerns about the maggots getting into the facility. Um, when you are building your team before administration uh, is uh, uh, discussing the pros and cons, you have the opportunity to select individuals that you may have worked with before that you may know, and you can educate them. You can tell them, you can give them information. Uh, you are recruiting them to be on, their, on your side. Um, and you can pick and choose uh, people who um, you feel would be receptive. If they're not, you educate them. If they're still not, then you look for another team member. Uh, but once it, uh, gets put through higher uh, through the channels, um, and the administrators are looking for uh, input. Uh, you no longer have that same opportunity to educate those individuals, uh, let alone to choose those who may have a more favorable outlook. So do your homework, uh, carefully select your team member, gather your uh, group of uh, supporters, and then they can um, work with you to uh, approach the administration and set up the, the uh, program. As I said, uh, this is all set out in more detail in uh, wound care advisor available off the uh, web. And then finally, you're going to certainly be asked for a policy and procedure uh, if you want to set up your program. Uh, that's always difficult if you don't have a program, if you've never done a procedure, how do you write a policy and procedure? Well, the Better Foundation has done that for you you will need to put it on your own form to tweak it according to the uh, specific needs of your facility, uh, but there are plenty of details right there. Here's another aid that might help you. Uh, it's a patient brochure. Uh, you are welcome to download that from the Better Foundation uh, website as well. Uh, it's useful not only to show that you will be um, training, teaching, uh, educating patients, but I know a lot of the team members that you put together and maybe even the administration will uh, derive some benefit reading through this uh, six or eight page brochure. Question number 10, when to choose maggot therapy over surgical therapy? So I think we touched upon this uh, a minute ago. Uh, basically, uh, sharp debridement, if that's the issue before you, debridement, if you can do a sharp debridement without too much pain, without too much cost, without too much intrusion on uh, surgical time or nursing time, depending on who's gonna do the debridement, go for the surgical debridement. If, however, uh, you have taken out as much as you can safely and further sharp debridement could be dangerous, let's say for a Fournier's gangrene or a deep um, fasciitis or some, some other wound that um, where there are exposed nerves and major vessels and it's hard to see what's viable, what's not viable, uh, where the patient cannot tolerate um, um, anesthesia and debridement at the bedside is, is not uh, going to be sufficient. Uh, you need to go to the OR and they cannot. These are all the times that are appropriate to choose uh, the maggot therapy. Again, 
I don't call that maggot therapy over surgical therapy. Um, I call that uh, maggot therapy as uh, an alternative, a second, uh, a second best, but really, really good. Uh, yes, it has some advantages and disadvantages, but um, go for the surgery if you can do it. Uh, where there's clearly a, an advantage of maggot debridement over uh, other forms of, well, there's a, there are lots of advantages and disadvantages uh, of the maggot therapy and the surgical therapy. So let me rephrase that. Where you often have a real choice between debridement treatments are the non-surgical treatments. Once surgery is deemed not appropriate, not necessary, uh, or not uh, safe, the real question becomes, do I do maggot therapy or do I do enzymatic debridement or some other treatment. And I think there it's a much clearer choice in my mind and, and most people who are uh, um, comfortable using maggot therapy, the maggot therapy is so much faster uh, than dressing changes. It is less expensive and less time if you compare a two-day treatment to a two-month treatment of uh, enzymatic uh, or other dressing type uh, uh, debris mod therapy. Question 11, what is the cost of maggot therapy and is it typically covered by insurance or Medicare or even Medicaid? Uh, I think we have more questions. Is it covered by insurance? Very common question. Is maggot therapy covered by insurance? Maggot therapy, what are the costs? The costs are, yeah, the maggots. Um, and depending on where you get your medical grade maggots, uh, it's going to be about the cost of one tube of collagenase. I think uh, uh, I recently paid $300 for a tube of collagenase. Um, uh, um, you can purchase these days medicinal maggots in the United States for $250. Um, but additional costs you have to keep in mind are uh, a net dressing to contain the maggots, uh, shipping if you are going to ship from a long distance, the maggots have to be shipped uh, overnight because they're highly perishable. They cannot sit, uh, sit on a truck or in a warehouse somewhere. Um, and so those would be additional costs. Um, is it covered by insurance? That's really the, the more important question, isn't it? Because uh, if something is covered by insurance, whether it's $1,000 or $25, um, the, the, um, the problems of obtaining it from the per patient's perspective, uh, can they afford it, are, are um, the same, are mute, um, unless the patient does not have insurance. Well, the uh, simple answer for does insurance pay for it, does Medicare, does Medicaid pay for it, the answer is yes. But there are caveats to keep in mind. And the most important one is that insurance companies 
make their money by not paying for procedures. Um, and so we should all be aware that if there's any opportunity that a um, that an insurance company is not going to have to pay for it, they will take that opportunity. They have huge teams of staff whose job is to make sure that if you did not write down the justification called indication, uh, that they are not going to pay. If you wrote down the wrong uh, indication, uh, they do not need to pay, uh, so on and so on and so forth. That's how they, they um, make their, um, uh, that's how they earn their living. Um, and they don't make it easy to code for the maggots, but uh, there is some advice, coding advice and uh, information and assistance from the Better Foundation, if you're interested. Um, also, um, Codepedia has an article about coding for maggots. Uh, Aetna Insurance puts their maggot therapy um, um, uh, com compensation co uh, reimbursement pol policy uh, on the internet. It's available for anyone to, to look at, and I would suggest checking it out. Aetna policy for leech therapy and maggot therapy. And you can see right there, what they uh, expect in terms of um, justification, indications, documentation, and so on and so forth. Um, I will tell you though, from uh, many years of experience that I have never uh, encountered uh, an insurance company or Medicare or Medicaid not paying for the maggots, uh, even if it was turned down on first attempt um, and then submitted as, as an appeal. Uh, because when you appeal um, a decision like that, then you are in contact, not with a clerical person, but with a healthcare professional. And that healthcare professional understands about wound, wound care, debridement, uh, maggots. Uh, they will understand that the um, that the cost is appropriate and and well worth it as long as you have included the appropriate uh, documentation. If you have any questions or problems, uh, let us know. We, the Better Foundation, do have a patient assistance grant program for people that don't have insurance um, and don't qualify for Medicare, Medicaid, um, uh, and are unable to, to afford their, um, their biotherapy uh, products. Uh, so you can also contact us for patient assistance grants to help pay for that. Well, I uh, actually didn't answer this question number 14. Would you have a video of the process of placing maggots and removing maggots? Yes, we have several uh, videos that are available from our website. It's about five minutes before the hour. We're about to stop. Um, so I'm gonna take a, a break uh, and ask Albert if there are any questions in the chat that uh, I didn't see or any other questions that came to you.
Um, I didn't see any questions in the uh, chat, Dr. Shun. Do you have any questions, Albert, or anything <laughs> that I, I, I left out maybe that I should touch upon? Um, I think you answered the questions quite thoroughly. I'll put it on my end. Quite completely. Too long-winded, huh? All right. No, no, no. It's very <laughs> thorough. Very helpful. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, maybe I'll just take uh, one more question. It's question 15 and, and wrap it up. Uh, what is it? To control maggots in dressing, do you count the number of maggots in and maggots out for each dressing? Very important question. I hear this all the time. Uh, definitely do not count the maggots going in, uh, nor the maggots going out. I'm going to stop sharing so I can look at everybody there. And the reason is because the numbers won't be the same. And that's okay. You don't actually want them to be the same. You want enough maggots there to eat everything on the plate or everything in the wound, all the necrotic tissue in the wound. And you don't want to let you don't want them to, to leave anything behind. And in order to do that, we apply a number of maggots, five to ten per square centimeter. Uh, so that everybody is, um, so that everything is going to be gone. And there will be some stragglers that may not even uh, have a chance to, to get anything. And they will likely die of starvation. And that's okay, because once they die, they themselves become necrotic tissue which dissolves just like the wound necrotic tissue. So you won't find dead maggots if everything goes according to plan. Uh, you won't find dead maggots. They will have been dissolved and they, uh, by, the, by the faster eating, faster growing live maggots. Um, so if you count the maggots in and count the maggots out, you will, number one, spend all day trying to count maggots. Uh, they're not easy to count. And number two, uh, very likely not come out with the same number, which will just cause lots of anxiety. So don't do it. Um, the maggots are self-extracting. The real worry is, what if I left a maggot behind? And I can assure you, that the maggots have had a no child left behind policy, policy longer than uh, the uh, Federal uh, Department of Education has. Um, no maggots will be left behind. Uh, the dead ones won't because they'll be dissolved and eaten. Uh, and the live ones won't because their natural tendency is to crawl out of the wound away from the host as soon as there is no necrotic tissue left or as soon as they are satiated. Um, and we like those two to be about the same, the same time. Well, with that, I'll ask one more time, Albert, if uh, there have been any, any more questions than what we covered. Uh, let's see. No, I, I don't see any questions, Dr. Sherman. No additional questions. Okay. Well, I will close here then. Uh, I will thank everyone for attending today's session or sending uh, questions in advance. If you send in questions in advance and were not able to join us for the live session, um, hopefully you'll be able to see the answers to uh, your questions in the recording. And if we didn't get to your question, uh, by all means, we will try and get to it next time or uh, send us a, a reminder 
and say, hey, you didn't, you didn't get to, our, to my question um, and I can't wait till next month. So <laughs> please tell me, uh, does insurance pay for maggot therapy or not? So take care everyone. Thank you, Albert, um, for making this possible. Um, until next month, bye-bye.